How do I know, Mario, that Satan has got power over me? How do I know? Here are the indications. Extreme roller coaster emotions. You see, when Christ comes into a person, he evens out their temperament by the peace that passes understanding. They have a sudden sense that everything is going to be okay. They can't explain it. Second is if you're living a life where you're excusing behavior that used to horrify you and that you promised yourself you would never do or be. Now let's take for example, you at the age of 10, you at the age of 10, over here when you were 10 years old, the little girl that you were at the age of 10 had dreams, aspirations, and plans. And what would that little girl think of the woman you became and how you became that woman? Regardless of what society says, regardless of the hurts you've been through, what would that little girl say? When you were 10 years old, as a man, a, a boy, there were things you said to yourself what you wanted to do with your life, person you wanted to be. What would the man you are today, what would the 10-year-old think of you? Here we get to the worst part. The destruction of the peace of mind and the hurt. Because someone said to me, I don't believe sin is real. It defines sin for me, Mario. Define it. I'm maybe you don't mind if I preach a little bit more. You, are you okay? Let's look at sin not as breaking the Ten Commandments, but of what it does to you, not to other people, what it does to you. Sin is the tendency in a human being to have it all, the best moment, no reason to mess with it, completely. There is absolutely no reason to mess up what you've got, and you go ahead and mess it up anyway. That's sin. Now, you have allowed yourself to be debased. You've allowed yourself to be under the control of another person. You've allowed yourself to believe and have feelings. But I'm going to tell you, it's destroying the best thing at the worst possible time. Sin does it every time. I know pastors aren't talking about this, some of them. Thank God for all of them that are. But now, let me finish. The word that I want to finish with tonight is the word dread. I want you to look at me and I want to talk to you for just a moment about the word dread. One of the wealthiest men who ever lived, by far, he'd make... Jeff Bezos looked like a pauper, was Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled the world. Amazon still doesn't rule the world. Nebuchadnezzar did, and he had parties. And some of you will tell me, man, I live in Colorado. We love to party. You're nothing. Nebuchadnezzar had parties that lasted two years. And according to some studies, he released a vintage wine every night of the two years. That's 700 wines. He lived in a bedroom that was made of stone that was at least 18 inches thick of rock. He had the most well-trained security detail on earth. And one night, the Bible says that God visited him in a dream. It scared him so bad that both of his hip joints dislocated and his knees began to knock together. And the Bible says he lost the power to sleep. Let me tell you about God. If he can't scare you while you're awake. <laughs> and I don't care how wicked you are. You're going to have to sleep sometime. <laughs> Sin can do a lot of things, but it can't deprive you of sleep. It can't make it so you don't have to sleep. And so there's this thing that we feel. The most powerful people, Bill Gates feels it. 
since he's in that diary for Pleasure Island, he feels dread. You'd have all this power and feel dread. My, what's wrong with me that when everything's going right, there is in the center of my being this sense that there's something bad going to happen to me because you have power over others. You have power over your money. You have power over where you live. You have power over your employees. You have power over your students. But you don't know where that hillside strangler is going to come and claim his rightful possession. So here comes Jesus. He went to the cross. He died a horrible death. And the Bible says that he went to hell. I know what he did. Went in there, met up with the devil, kicked that, kicked that fat cat in the teeth, grabbed the keys of hell in the grave, and came up on Easter morning. So I finished my speech to all the gurus. I said, you can give them this, and you can give them this, and you can give them all this stuff, but you cannot give them peace of mind. Peyote won't do it. Drugs won't do it. Meditation won't do it. Going up to the secret worship stones of the mountain is not going to do it. You will never know peace. You will never know joy. You will never know innocence until you say, Jesus, take me as I am and wash away my sin and make me a new creation. Everybody close your eyes and nobody move. And I'm talking to the people outside this tent. I'm talking to everyone that could hear my voice. The Bible says that self-love would go crazy. Yes, it did. But there is a part of loving yourself that is valid and legitimate. And the Bible says to love God as you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it doesn't say not to love yourself. It says to love your neighbor just as much. So what does it mean to love yourself? It means that if you are putting on a show for other people at the expense of your own sanity, that you need to love yourself enough to say, my life does not work. People don't know it. I've put on a great front. But people don't know what I know in the secret recesses of my time alone, in the, way, the moments right before I go to sleep, in the first waking moments of the morning, I know that there's a piece of me that is slowly rotting and deteriorating. And I'm becoming something that I feel like I can't stop. So I'm going to ask you right now to let me take the devil off of your back. That's what I want to do. I want to take Satan off your back. Mara, I've got habits I want to break. I've got emotions I want to get rid of. I've got vultures that feed on me day and night with a loneliness that can't even find words. I live in an indefinable prison that no one but me and God know anything about. And I want to get out. And I want to be set free. And I want you to pray with me, man of God, that I will know joy and gladness and peace. And that the power of the devil will be broken off of me once and for all. Well, you may say, man of God, you're not talking to me. I go to church. The devil followed you in. Because he knew that all you had done is ask God to renegotiate the contract of the Bible. That's all you did. I want you to renegotiate the part about adultery. I want you to renegotiate the part about where as a disciple I have to do what you say and live by your word. And that's why your life still hurts. All right. Emotions that reel. Loneliness that's very deep. Depression that comes on you 
as suddenly as the storms come off these mountains. Despair, hopelessness, all of it. All of what the Bible said, the last days, the, every disease of the human heart would intensify and it would make the power of Jesus more eminent, essential, and urgent. Now I'm going to pray for you, wherever you are. I'm going to pray for you to repent. I'm going to pray for you to admit in your heart that today you should have a new life. Tonight when I go to bed, I want to know that my future is assured. Tonight when I go to bed, I want to know that every habit that I want to break will be broken by the power of the Holy Spirit. When I raise my hand, I'm going to tell God by my upraised hand that tonight I am through with hurting, fearing, being angry, being addicted, and being overcome with a growing, dehumanizing feeling in my soul. Now here's what I want to finish with. I want to pray for you. God knows how much I want to pray for you. So if you are here in this tent, and you'll say, Mario, would you pray with me that God will take the devil off my back and give me a new life? That his power will be broken in me once and for all by the blood of Jesus and by the power of the cross and the resurrection that I will be safe in the arms of God. Not only saved, not only safe, but sane and free and pure and forgiven with a rest that will say, I know that I know that I know that Jesus has stepped into my crisis and has stood between me and the devil the way he stood between that adulteress and the men who were about to throw rocks at her. That God will step in between you and your pain and give you a new life right now. Mario, will you pray for me that Christ will get the devil's power off of my back and I'll be set free. If that's you, put your hand up right now. Ever since I've been in Colorado Springs, I have been shocked by the harvest. I want everyone with your hands raised, stand up right now. Stand up. Prove to the devil that you're free by standing your feet. If you raise your hand. Now, I want to get them in here as fast as possible. Those of you outside the tent who are standing because you want me to pray for you for the devil to get off your back, and that's why you stood. You want to be set free. Start walking down these aisles right now from outside. Come now. Come from over here. Come from over there. Start walking right now. Start walking. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you. Every step you take, you're going to be free. Every habit is going to break. Every drug will be broken off of your body. Come. Come. Come from here. Come from there. Come. Stand right here. Stand. Stand. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Broken. Addicted. Afraid. Mara, you don't know the sins I've committed. It's going to all be washed away. It's all going to be washed away. Now, those of you inside the tent, come to the nearest aisle and join these. Make your way now. Come. Don't have one of you change your mind. Don't you dare stay in slavery. This is already the largest response during this entire crusade. We have more souls coming to Jesus. Fill in over here. This is a beautiful problem, but I need our workers and ushers to make sure everyone can get as close as possible. There are approximately, we estimate about 4,000 people here. 
and listen to me. It looks like about 25% of them are standing to be set free by the power of Jesus. <laughs>